Welcome to another episode of the Avialog Lecture Forum. Earlier this month, we spoke about the Nonaligned Movement. That is because this month has been deemed to be appropriate in focusing on the Nonaligned Movement, given the role Sri Lanka has played in NAM, and that was in 1976, uh, exactly 45 years ago. Plus, we go back to 1961, Belgrade, Yugoslavia, when the first NAM summit took place when the online movement came into creation, came into being. So the focus today at this particular session of the Avalog Lecture Forum is where we look at the non-aligned movement, its principles, and their relevance to Sri Lanka's foreign policy. Sri Lanka has been a country that has been in the non-aligned movement from its inception. And if you go beyond that was also the location of the country uh, where we had the first Colombo conference taking place in 1954, and thereafter, we went on to Bandung from here. So talk to us about this particular area to uh, give us his views. We have, we are very honored, the Avalog Lecture Forum is very honored to have a very senior professor who is currently in the United States. It's very early in the morning there for you, Professor. Thank you so much for taking time to uh, join us uh, so early in the day for you. Um, Dr. S.I. Keith Ponkalan is a professor of conflict resolution at Salisbury University in Maryland in the United States of America. He was chair of the Conflict Analysis and Dispute Resolution Department from 2011 to 2018. Uh, before joining Salisbury University in 2011, he was a professor of political science and chair of the Department of Political Science and Public Policy at the University of Colombo in Sri Lanka. Dr. Keita Ponkalan has also served as a researcher in several international institutions, including the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research in Geneva, and also the United Nations University in Tokyo. He has served also as a consultant to Sri Lankan projects of several international agencies and has numerous publications under his belt over the years uh, to which he has contributed on a variety of topics, including Sri Lanka, democracy and reconciliation. He's written on the peace process and party politics. He's written on North-South relations and human rights. He's looked at the case study of Sri Lanka from a small power struggle for independence in the independent era. Uh, he's also looked at Chinese presence in Sri Lanka and looked at the relationship between Sri Lanka and India. So no doubt someone who has an extensive uh, array of research that he has done in this particular field. And we are very honored, sir, to have you joining us today and speaking to us on the non-aligned movement, its principles and their relevance to Sri Lanka's foreign policy. Over to you, sir. Good morning, uh, every, every, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit confused what to say because it's early in the morning. I'm still in the morning mood, uh, but it's evening for you guys. Uh, some of you are joining from Sri Lanka. Very happy to see you. I haven't been in a Sri Lankan meeting for a long, long time now. So very, very happy to see your presence here. Thank you very much, Dr. Cook, for that very, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, I was wondering, is he talking about me or somebody, someone else? Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, I have, a, uh, I have uh, prepared a um, PowerPoint, uh, so I'm going to share that. Uh, the main reason for reason, uh, using the PowerPoint is to make sure you don't have to watch my face for one hour, so you can look at something else. Uh, so let me share the, um, all point. Um, Non-aligned movement. Um, I uh, um, I teach at the Salisbury University, as uh, George indicated. Um, we have a very vibrant uh, master's program in conflict resolution and also um, medium size um, undergraduate program. So I teach in um, both programs, two courses for the uh, graduate program and uh, two courses for the undergraduate program. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, courses I teach in the undergraduate program is international conflict and conflict resolution. That is a third year level course we call it junior level, uh, upper level course. Uh, so we focus on uh, contemporary uh, conflict and conflict resolution. 
uh, but we start the course from 1945, the discussion from 1945. So in that backdrop, I talk a little bit about Cold War in the class. Uh, when I talk about Cold War, I all, every, every year when I teach that course, I ask the students, how many of you have heard about an entity called non-aligned movement? And 99.5% of the students don't know, never heard about it. Maybe it's known in the Washington DC circles, uh, people focus on third world issue, may know it, but other than that, nobody really knows about the organization. This is the, the, the second largest entity in, in, in the world, right? Um, but that's not the case in, in our part of the world. Uh, you guys know very well the entity, organization, its background, et cetera. Therefore, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, explaining the background and the philosophies of the non-aligned movement that I assume you guys already know. Um, but maybe very briefly, what I have done is uh, divide this presentation. Uh, George, uh, give me a warning if I'm taking too much time after your 20 minute uh, deadline. Um, so I have uh, divided the presentation into two large segments, uh, relatively. One, I will talk about the movement a little bit and talk about the idea of neutrality from Sri Lankan foreign policy perspective a little bit. Then maybe we can come back to the organization if you are interested. Uh, but I think we should focus on the, the contemporary issues Sri Lanka facing that would be more useful, I think. Um, anyways, um, as um, George indicated Bandung uh, was the, the, the catalyst. Uh, interestingly, myself and George met in Bandung for the first time. Uh, we met after some, sometimes after, after that, but first time in Bandung in a, in a, in a conference. Uh, interesting uh, aspect about Bandung is some of the Western scholars argue Bandung conference had nothing to do with non-alignment because it came later in 1961. Um, but there is some connection uh, in the Bandung conference, the leaders uh, expressed the desire to stay away from superpower rivalry. From that idea, uh, you know, evolved the concept of non-alignment later in 1961, you know, taking the, the formal shape. Um, I don't know if it's a, a misunderstanding or maybe people are a little bit ignorant. Um, Non-aligned movement, NAM, has several objectives, several objectives, not just one objective of non, not aligning with one of the superpowers. That is definitely a cornerstone, a very basic idea, but there are other, other objectives as well. So this factor is very relevant for contemporary discussion about NAM. Therefore, I have highlighted that fundamental um, objective of the organization. And you see number two, number three, number four, number five are also uh, objectives of the organization adopted perhaps later, uh, originally decolonization because uh, it was 1961. And when in 1960s, 1970s, Asia and South Asia was completely free from colonial, colonial uh, control. Therefore, we did not feel about colonialism in that period. But Africa is a different story. In Africa, some of the st states were still under colonial control in the 60th and 60s and 70s. And some states did not have the prospect of getting independence uh, soon. Therefore, colonialism also, you know, decolonization was also kind of a, um, one of the major objectives of the organization. So the point I'm trying to make is, you know, it is wrong to focus entirely on the idea of not, not aligning with one of the superpowers. The entity has multiple objectives. Um, then as you guys know, the Cold War ended and then uh, some of the Western scholars turned to 
now in a very negative way. So here you can see uh, some of the reactions of the Western scholars about Nam after the end of the Old War. It's very negative. One. Two, they were arguing the organization should be, should be um, um, dissolved because now there is no polarization. There are no two uh, rival superpowers. The US emerged as the only surviving superpower and the world became a unipolar uh, system. Therefore, the idea of not aligning doesn't apply anymore. Therefore, you should dissolve the organization was the, um, was the argument. And I don't want to go into these publications seriously, but you can see the, the, uh, the quoted terms. They're all very negative. These are all Western, Western uh, uh, scholars and researchers. So this is one of the uh, very prominent person, Jansen, writes about non-alignment all the time. Uh, so he was also very uh, uh, negative about the entity and kind of arguing it should be dissolved. So one of the examples of a group of scholars arguing it should, it should go, it should be dissolved. Without realizing these scholars made a fundamental error in their assumption. And I published a paper on non-aligned movement um, from a global perspective. This paper was not written from a Sri Lankan perspective. I don't think I have even mentioned the term Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka in this paper. Uh, so this was published in 19, uh, uh, 2016. Um, the original paper was published in Bandung conference, or I mean, a seminar in 15, then I uh, updated and developed, and it went through the uh, review process and it was published. In this paper, I made a, a, an argument that these scholars, the Western scholars who argue for the dissolution of the, uh, uh, of the uh, NAM missed one significant point they, they innocently assumed that the new international order created after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is the unipolar world with the US as the only surviving superpower, will remain forever. So they assume this new structure is going to be permanent Therefore, the third world people or the states don't need an organization that promotes non-alignment. And I argue in this paper, if you look at the history of the world, you will easily notice that the international system is dynamic. It keeps changing. Um, before Second World War, we had a multipolar world, we had different centers of power, uh, US, Soviet Union, uh, British, uh, France, uh, and other states, several states, even, even before the 18th, 19th century, several European states were like the centers of power. That changed after the uh, Second World War. After the Second World War, the, the international system became a bipolar system where you had two centers of power, Soviet Union and the US. And that changed in 1990 because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And these people assumed that this is going to be permanent. And I argued, I made the argument in this paper, you know, this could also change. This could also change and we could go back to a multipolar world or a bipolar world again because of the growth of some of the states outside the Western hemisphere. For example, in that time, uh, China was booming, uh, India was uh, developing very well economically and it had uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Brazil had some promise, South, South Africa had promise. 
uh, Germany was very strong. Therefore, there was always, and also at the same time, at the same time, when other states like China coming up, the US was seeing a decline. US was de declining. And some of the, uh, the Western scholars went one step further and argue that we were in a post-American world in the 21st century. They thought America was gone. So the point is, we could have moved on to a new structure in the future. We could, we could move into a new structure in the future. And possibly there are several superpowers or maybe two superpowers like China and the US. Um, then the third world should uh, face the, the dilemma of whether to align with one or the other. And we, do, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Therefore, I argue, based on that argument, um, I argue we should preserve the organization and strengthen it and be ready for the future because it's possible there will be another superpower in the, in, in the future. If that happens, then we don't have to start from 1955 again. So that was my argument um, in that paper. And that was only one, one argument. I had a second argument that the third world has unique issues common to many small and weak states. Um, and we needed a third world organization, an organization that brings in all these uh, states from the global south to tackle these common issues. So here in this slide, I have listed three issues. There may be other issues as well. Uh, climate change, I think, is increasingly becoming very, very uh, crucial and relevant. Therefore, the argument is that we should preserve it and strengthen it. And how do you strengthen and reform it? And the same paper, I went into that discussion as well. Um, I argued, you know, you, you, you can think about the uh, reform or reorientation in different ways. Uh, essentially, if you really want to do it, maybe set up a committee to study the organization and come up with a plan and then implement. That is up to the policymakers and the leaders of NAM. But me as an outsider, was kind of an observer and had the opportunity to observe the um, operation of the organization uh, closely when I was in, in, in Sri Lanka, seeing Sri Lanka so in, in, in NAM. And I have some ideas and I never hesitate to give my, give my opinion. Uh, my students, some of them are here, they know that uh, I never hesitate to give my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and I argued in that paper that maybe, maybe three kind of types, three types of changes should be implemented. One symbolic change, structural change and policy change. Symbolic change maybe change the name, you know, because we are calling it non-alignment. So everybody is criticizing it's not, you don't need non-alignment anymore. Uh, so I, some of the terminologies that could come into the title in my view are like global south and people have attachment to the word movement. So maybe that could also be, be, be uh, retained. So it's like uh, something like, you know, a movement of uh, global south, something like that. Uh, and then st structural change. One of the reasons why the organization is, is uh, weak is that, uh, is that um, it doesn't have a structure, it moves around. And the third one, change the policies, bring in other, other issues to the, to the fore of the agenda, poverty alleviation, climate change, etc. George, am I, am I taking too much time? That's fine, sir. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's up to the leaders. I had some um, really good response uh, from some of the uh, activists uh, in the Western part of the world, calling me, sending me emails and you know, talking to me about what ideas I have. That was very encouraging. People really wanted to know what I think about it. Uh, some of them telephoned me, really, really to, you know, uh, uh, leadership uh, in, in leadership position. So it was, I was encar encouraged. Uh, maybe it could happen in the future, and maybe maybe uh, I can share my uh, opinion in the future as well. And 
as you guys know, NAM was a weak organization, weak entity. And now it's almost, almost um, dead, right? And the movement was impacted by several issues. And I have listed some of the issues. The members are poor countries, small state, weak countries, under development, they don't have good democracies. And when you don't have a good democratic structure, you have less legitimacy internationally, uh, some of the major issues. But in my view, the primary issues in relation to NAM is their deception. The, the entire organization was deception. It is not real. You know, you cannot win with decep deceptive ideas and deceptive uh, uh, structures. What do I mean by deception? Deception is that most of the member states are not really non-aligned. They were faking. They were faking the concept of non-alignment. Take many states in Africa. They were pro-Soviet because of their socialist leanings. India was pro-Soviet. Uh, Pakistan, I originally when I was preparing the slide, I said pro-US, then I have extensive experience in Pakistan. I have traveled, I have friends, I have gone to the universities, uh, helped my friends with lectures, seminars, and everything. We have done research together. So I have a close relation with China and was thinking about it and thought maybe Pakistan is not pro-US because there's high anti-US sentiment at the social level and also political level. So I, I, I changed my, uh, my tag to maybe it's, it, it was aligned with US rather than calling it pro-US state. So there is a difference between saying Pakistan is a pro-US state and Pakistan was aligned with the US and I, I'm sure you guys can understand that difference. Um, and Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is one of the another deceptive member. Deceptive member, never was really, really non aligned And I would like to call, if I write another piece about Sri Lanka non aligned I would call Sri Lanka swinging partnership state. Why? It was not permanent alliance. The alliance was keep swinging, depending on which party was in power. Uh, during the uh, SLFE governments, it's more pro-China and pro -China, pro Soviet, pro-Russia. Uh, Bandar Naike was a big fan of India as well. And India was pro-Soviet. Uh, under UNP governments, um, it's pro-West, pro-US. So the partnership, Sri Lanka was always partners, partnering with other, other superpowers, different superpowers, it keeps swinging. So um, maybe that aspect could be explored in the future. Uh, therefore, um, Sri Lanka, I would say another deceptive member of the organization. Um, then that discussion, I started thinking about issues after George spoke to me about the presentation. And I came to the conclusion, uh, non-alignment and the idea of neutrality has something to do with Indian intervention in 1987 with the experience of IPKF. India intervened in Sri Lanka for different reasons. So I have given three major reasons here in the slide. Uh, you can see, um, um, see um, um, spillover effect. Um, spillover effect. Uh, that means the Sri Lankan conflict was spilling into Tamil Nadu politics and Tamil Nadu was becoming uh, radical. Um, and there was also a possibility of, you know, Tamil Nadu becoming nationalistic and demanding separation from Delhi. Uh, and then it was affecting Sri Lankan uh, Indian security. So it has to be careful because this uh, partnership with, between, between um, the Tamil nationalist uh, militants and uh, Indian elements. And then also Sri Lanka was working with external powers to deal with the conflict that created security dilemma. 
for India and also as a, as a superpower in the region, uh, India assumed that um, it has a responsibility that was the, uh, the security manager. So it has to manage conflicts in the region and everyone talks about Maldives, that's another example. That's when Maldives was invaded by Tamil militants. Uh, India immediately went in and saved the Maldives. So it, it, it uh, assumed the role of security manager in the in the in the region. Um, those are some of the reasons why India intervened. But one other very significant reason, as you guys know, is that in this period, Jayawardene government was becoming pro-West, while India retained a pro-socialist leaning policy uh, position, whatever you call it. Therefore, India did not like the Sri Lankan Western, the move towards Western states, uh, you know, uh, accommodating Voice of America, Western companies. It was a big deal in, in 1980s. Now we don't, we don't feel like that because the globalization has uh, taken over. But in the 80s, it was a big deal. Sri Lanka was going the Western, Western way. Therefore, India intervened in order to prevent Sri Lanka becoming a West, pro-Western state, right? Um, and if you study the uh, 1987 um, um, Indo-Lanka agreement, the text, the original, uh, the agreement, you would see there are provisions that prevented Sri Lanka from taking steps that would undermine uh, Indian security. For example, Trincomalee uh, and other facilities. Therefore, the, my argument is India intervened, one of the reasons due to the Sri Lankan movements to movement to, towards uh, US, US and other Western, Western states. So my argument, as you could, could see, is that Sri, since Sri Lanka was faking the idea of on alignment, uh, there was an external intervention. So this point is very relevant for me. Um, why contemporary Sri Lankan foreign policy is strongly pro-China? Sri Lanka has become uh, almost like a very close partner of China and various examples could be cited, for example, um, uh, the Hambantota port, airports, mega projects, road development projects. Uh, Luna Pokuna, right? Luna Pokuna. Uh, and the eastern terminal issue. Uh, and Sri Lanka publishing, uh, releasing coins to commemorate. Chinese uh, Communist Party, you know, all, all are examples I can cite to argue that Sri Lanka has become a Chinese close partner. But I know supporters of this government and the leaders of this government are not going to like my argument because they would argue that Sri Lanka is truly a non-aligned country. Neutrality is our policy is the argument made by contemporary Sri Lankan political leaders, especially of the SLPP. But for an independent an analyst, it's very clear, clear that Sri Lanka has become a China's friend, right? Then my question is, would, would um, India allow Sri Lanka to become fully fledged Chinese ally. Right now, mm, right now, um, India, I don't know how, how they are really feeling in New Delhi, in the inner circles, but it gives us the impression it doesn't care. It doesn't worry about increasing Chinese presence uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka. And recently I saw a statement from one of the military leaders that they believe um, that India will not act against 
India, uh, Sri Lanka will not act against India. Correct. I, I don't think Sri Lanka will act against India. But what happens if China acts against India from Sri Lanka? Once you have built enough, China could, China could, uh, China could uh, do so many things. And I think India will realize that factor one day. Maybe not in, not under BJP government, uh, because they they are giving me the signals that they don't they are not worried. Uh, but there may be a change of government in the future, and new government will think differently, and perhaps could take drastic actions. Therefore, to be honest, if this trend of Chinese influence increasing continues in Sri Lanka, the possibility of future Indian intervention also creates in my mind. I may be wrong, I may be wrong, but in my mind, that possibility increases. Uh, not only India, and I ask, let me ask another field, another question. Why is US acting against Sri Lanka in Geneva? That's because Sri Lanka has deviated from the Western world. I do not believe the Geneva process is undertaken due to the Genevan concern of the Tamil interest. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe. That's one reason why I keep warning uh, Tamil people don't invest too much in Geneva. Uh, think about other possibilities, think about other uh, means, etc. Therefore, the, my argument is um, not only India, if this trend continues, other, other states also could intervene in Sri Lanka, different ways. The Western states now are using political means. And uh, my fear is maybe India could also change in the future. I don't, I don't know, but I, I sincerely, sincerely uh, believe that the, uh, the possibility going, is going, going up. Um, Then the idea of neutrality, philosophy. George said, talk about non-aligned non, non, um, philosophy. What is the philosophy? Being neutral, right? Not aligning with any of the superpowers. Since I feel NAM is almost dead and you need a really, uh, you, you need to really pump up to, to get it back in operation um, to revamp uh, need concrete action. Would that happen uh, in the near future? I'm not very optimistic about it. Uh, right now it's like it's functioning like a image booster for politicians in power when they need some sort of ceremony they can have a summit and have these uh, ceremonies and boost their images on, on media. Other than that, I don't see much of a value right now. Uh, therefore, it needs a serious rework in order to use it as a become a useful instrument. Uh, would that happen? I'm not sure. But my point is, we don't have to wait for NAM to be neutral and non-aligned. So I did, as, I, as, I, as I argued, the idea of non-alignment is very important for Sri Lanka's uh, foreign policy. Foreign policy. So we don't have to wait for the NAM to be non-aligned and neutral. Because the idea of non-alignment is historic, old. It existed even before, before, uh, before uh, um, um, before uh, NAM, right? And also, I also understand I'm not a religious uh, scholar. I have not done any research on uh, Buddhism. I don't know, but I know uh, living in Sri Lanka in a Buddhist society, uh, I know neutrality is very important in the Buddhist philosophy. Um, I did some research and, uh, and uh, found this word, uh, upeka, uh, upeka, uh, basic concept um, in Buddhism, 
Therefore, we have the idea of neutrality and not aligning uh, well-founded in our societies, in our thinking. And lots of people in the country are very supportive of NAM and the idea of neutrality. Therefore, we have to rethink the idea of uh, neutrality and try to be neutral rather than becoming becoming um, uh, ally of a specific strong power over perhaps a future future superpower. And I think I'm in my last last slide. Um, so two arguments. One, Sri Lanka should go back go back to its roots of the idea of neutrality and non-aligning, not aligning with one of the big powers, work with both powers uh, and be careful who our friends are. Uh, that's one. Number two, actually Sri Lanka can become an international force if it takes up the project of reforming the NAM because right now there's no leadership, right? In the re reform movement, Right now, there is no leader. So Sri Lanka can fill that vacuum if it has the, has the um, uh, desire and the will. Um, that, would be, that would be useful. So from a personal point of view, I would like to see NAM becoming a vibrant entity again, or maybe in the future uh, with a new uh, outlook and Sri Lanka becoming a little more neutral. That's, that's my point. With that, I end my presentation. George, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that very comprehensive overview, not only in terms of looking at NAM as a whole, looking at the origins, looking at where it started from, what the journey has been, but also looking at some of the salient aspects and how we have evolved within NAM, whether it was in the 60s or 70s, um, what kind of response we had in the 80s, some of the outcomes of those responses. Uh, today happens to be the 115th birth anniversary of Jaya Jayavardhana, and it was he who once had said that there are only two really non-aligned countries in the world, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, because uh, they don't try to support each other. Because everyone else has veered away from this path, as you very rightly pointed out. It might have been stalwart in online movement like countries like India, uh, some of the others who were seen as champions, pillars of this movement, have veered away from um, taking a middle path or a middle stance. They've always, at some point, lent. I guess this also, a point that you raised there, Professor, you talked about the term movement. This is where movements gather momentum and movements lose momentum. Uh, as you said, there has been some degree of deception there, and that's a very important term to use. Uh, why not call it, or why didn't they think of calling it the non-aligned organization or association, having a permanent headquarters? I guess these are some of the questions that come up when we reflect on 1961 and uh, where we have gone from then onwards. Um, but I would like to now open the floor. I mean, the audience, please uh, feel free to uh, send in your questions. Uh, you can send them in the chat box and we will field them to uh, Dr. Geeta Pankalam at this point. Um, may I just ask one thing just to start off the conversation in terms of where we're going. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about this term neutrality. Uh, for example, in Sri Lanka, in lots of other circles, globally too, neutrality has been a concept that has been discussed uh, extensively. Um, when we look at neutrality, we look at non-alignment. Now, is it a matter of, and this is where I remember it was SWRD Bandar Naika who said, um, he wanted to differentiate the two points. I think it was on the visit of Marshal Tito in 59, uh, where he said, we are committed to the hilt. And that was his famous committed to the hilt speech, where he went to the extent of saying, we are not sitting on the fence. We're not waiting to see which side is more opportune to jump onto that side. Instead, we are committed to peace. We are committed to nonviolence. Um, aren't we seeing a continuation of that idea in terms of, neutrality, because neutrality can be misconstrued. Isn't that so, sir? As you know, I'm in the academic, academic, academic field for a while now. I've been teaching in the university for a while. So uh, these debates about concepts and terms, are, um, are, um, uh, professors are crazy about it. Uh, and they would 
spend uh, months, years uh, debating terms. But I would say is, I don't care. I don't care. You, you use the term neutrality, you use the term non-aligned, whatever. Debate the essence, what we are saying. Don't go too close to one, one center of power. That's what we are saying. So whatever use you want to use, use it. I don't care. And I know people are debating uh, the term, as, as you rightly pointed out. But personally, I don't care. Use another term. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, Professor, you mentioned that even in American universities, something you've noticed is 99.5% of students probably never heard of NAM. Now, do you think that, of course, in its heyday, NAM played a very big role? It was the third force in the world. It, it was a very uh, well known, well recognized. Uh, the Americans and the Soviets were very concerned about NAM. I mean, whether it was Bandung, whether it was uh, uh, Belgrade, they were very concerned as to what these countries were getting together and doing. Do you think that given that the narrative is written very often in the West, in international relations, conveniently NAM has been downgraded or NAM has been given less importance in the IR narrative? Perhaps, um, partly, partly correct because uh, most of the, uh, the, um, uh, most of the um, um, research, uh, the projects were undertaken by Western, Western scholars. Therefore, they have this bias against this, uh, third world uh, movements. And also in the initial period, it was not seen as uh, truly non-aligned, uh, but, uh, kind of pro-Soviet entity, uh, just, uh, you know, trying to go against uh, the United States. Uh, even Sri Lanka, you could see the, one of the first things we did was to ask the Western um, interest to be removed. Um, so maybe that, that was one reason for the, for the, for the bias. Uh, but I wouldn't argue, I would not argue that most of the, uh, uh, the materials are written by Western, Western scholars. A lot of uh, books and articles have been written by third world people. But the problem is they publish in their own region. So for, see, for example, there are lots of publications on NAM from New Delhi. They don't reach the Western market. Uh, therefore, uh, yeah, it's true. Some of the major pieces have been written by Western, Western scholars and they have this bias. But people who have uh, uh, written about the NAM with uh, genuine interest published in their own regions, um, so maybe they, they did not reach the Western market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we have a question coming in from uh, Vipul Ananda. He asked the question, uh, do you think 1987 Indo-Lanka Accord is still relevant? and still impacts foreign policy in South Asia? That's the first part of his question. Uh, and he goes beyond that to say, and also regarding the Geneva process, should Tamil leaders now engage in diplomatic initiatives with China? First, um, uh, the Indo-Lanka agreement. Um, I, I, I don't think it's very relevant because uh, India doesn't care about it. Congress is not in power. BJP did not write the agreement. Therefore, they don't care. And they also have different way of looking at Sri Lanka, um, trying, to, trying to collaborate with the Sri Lankan government more rather than you know, taking hardline hard pol policy, um, uh, policies. Uh, therefore, they, uh, India doesn't have an interest in, in implementing the Indo-Lanka agreement. Uh, this is a this is a kind of assumption an argument not reality say for example in sri lanka sri lanka is thinking about introducing introducing a, a new constitution uh, if that happens underline underscore the word if uh, if that happens uh, and sri lanka decide to scrap the provincial council system and i personally don't believe india will you know fight for it Maybe it will ask Sri Lanka to retain it. 
but I don't think they will fight for it. Therefore, I don't see uh, I don't see uh, Indo Lanka agreement uh, playing a major role in the contemporary politics uh, of Sri Lanka or the Tamil Tamil people. Um, the, what, is, what is the second question? Uh, the second Dr. question is, and also regarding the Geneva process, should Tamil leaders now engage in diplomatic initiatives with China? Absolutely. Why, why ignore? Why ignore a powerful state in the world? So that is, that is the Tamil problem. They always want to stick with India. Um, so they have to reorient because international reality is changing. Um, therefore, collaborating with any state, because also also the lines are not very uh, very uh, clear right now, right? Um, China, it's not uh, completely communist, uh, socialist, etc. Capitalism is involved. Uh, the middle class is uh, is uh, is uh, coming up. Maybe there will be changes in the Chinese society as well in the future. Therefore, I would not completely shut down uh, the interaction or relations with China, if it's possible. China has interest, interest in working with the governments. They don't, they don't um, worry too much about non-state entities. Therefore, maybe the issue is both sides. Sri Lankan Tamils still have not learned to deal with China. And China is also not very, not very interested in non-state actors like uh, Tamil parties. So problem emerge from, the, from both sides. And I agree with the, uh, who asked the question, uh, Siva Kumar, I guess. Uh, yes, Siva Kumar. Uh, Siva Kumar, uh, I agree the, the Sri Lankan uh, leadership, political leadership should think about China and come up with a way to deal with it because it is possible China would become an extremely crucial player in Sri Lanka in the future. Um, so Ashan is asking the question, what benefits have Sri Lanka received by being a member of NAM? Has it contributed in tangible terms to the development of the country. As I, as I argued, uh, it was weak from the beginning, right? The entity was weak from the beginning. But it gave a forum for a third world country to play a significant role in an international organization. So Sri Lanka became the chair, chair, chair country in the 70s. So we had an opportunity to be leaders in the international arena through the entity. So those are some of the some of the uh, some of the uh, benefits I would say. Um, but in terms of um, tangible uh, benefits, um, maybe maybe very 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 little. That's why I, I I like to emphasize the idea of neutrality or whatever term you want to call. Um, rather than the entity, hmm. you know, until the entity become vibrant and strong, we should have a um, dual track process, work on, work on the organization to strengthen it. Uh, therefore, in the future, if there is a, a third world issue, uh, because say, say, take, take for example, uh, climate change, the Western states are not very, very serious about climate change, right? why they are in like a, like a little bit cooler environment. Um, uh, the uh, change come to them last. Therefore, they don't feel the, the impact of climate change, but we feel it very strongly. People, people in, 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 in Sri Lanka, like places like Sri Lanka. So it will take time for them. And also there's some of them are ideologically opposed to the idea of climate change. They, they, don't, they don't believe they, in, in, in the US, for example, there are there are people who think you know it is still snowing, so why worry about worry about uh, worry about uh, climate change? So it will take time for them to realize and you know, act on it. But uh, for the third world countries and places like uh, Sri Lanka, small island states, the, the the impact may be a little stronger. So in order to deal with common issues, we need we need an entity. And I, I believe uh, uh, Nam could play that, that role. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't completely uh, reject it saying we did not benefit from it. Uh, Ranmali is asking, this is leading on from the points that you raised about um, 
Sri Lankan foreign policy changes, uh, she's asking, is it possible for Sri Lanka to follow a middle path? I guess this is given geopolitics, given our location, given everything happening. Is it possible? We are not even trying. We are not even trying. We are willing. We are willing to go one way. Uh, that's my problem. Uh, at least we should try. Maybe you are right. It's very difficult to dis. Very difficult to. I don't want to be too controversial. Um, it is, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, get independence from China. Uh, so it's going to be a challenge. But if we try, maybe we can do it in the in in the in the in the long run. Because as I said, Ranmali, as I said, it's in our 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 um, uh, way of life. We we believe in it, and we like the idea. Therefore, I don't think it will be impossible. Uh, it's possible in the in the long run. So maybe we should slow it down before it becomes too late. And then try to be uh, true. And I think I don't think one of the points um, uh, I would like to make is being neutral will not impact us negatively. Because if you are truly, truly, truly um, uh, non-aligned or neutral, uh, because I don't want to get into again the, the terminology uh, discussion. Um, both powers will work with us. So maybe we will get more, <laughs> more benefits uh, by being uh, truly neutral, uh, but we have taken the path of one, one, one way and we are moving towards that path uh, and getting benefits from, I mean, he, tremendous, huge uh, input or inducement from, from, from China. Uh, so it will be uh, challenging. Um, Osante is actually agreeing in a comment. He's saying, I really focus on the idea of restructuring of the objectives of NAM. I think it should further focus on conflicts and terrorism in the areas with other issues, such as economic issues, poverty in the developing world. Um, wasn't this something that NAM tried to take up earlier on too, Professor? Did NAM also look at terrorism? It looked at economic issues, for example, post- yeah, absolutely. post absolutely, 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 because States always have an uh, interest in, in terrorism, right? With terrorism, always non-state actors activity. Uh, NAM is also a, a state-centric entity. So they had a common interest in, you know, dealing with terrorism, with things like terrorism. Uh, so they focused on uh, poverty, racism, uh, uh, decolonization, as I pointed out in my second slide, I guess. Uh, they had several um, mm -hmm. objectives and the goalposts were keep moving, right? because the entity was trying to change, uh, adapt to the new realities, uh, which was not uh, wrong. Yeah. And actually, we'll, we'll probably come to this as one of our final questions, Professor Kalana is asking, and I think this is also in keeping with Sri Lankan foreign policy where India remains a cornerstone in our foreign policy formulation. Uh, he's asking the question, um, how do you assess Narendra Modi's government's involvement in the non-aligned movement today? Because I guess if India shows interest, we're going to see NAM growing further, at least in our region. I think India is, I, I, I don't know whether Kalana is, is arguing that India is a very important factor in the Sri Lankan foreign policy right now. I don't believe, I don't believe uh, after 2009, India is a relevant factor in the Sri Lankan uh, foreign policy, uh, as I put it uh, in my, I think, uh, one of the slides, um, the the end of the the end of the war liberated Sri Lanka's foreign policy from India. Uh, the first line, read the first line. Um, so I don't think India is very relevant uh, for Sri Lanka's uh, foreign policy right now. Um, India is working closely with US, Narendra Modi's government and US are good friends. Um, if I remember correctly, um, President Obama visited Delhi twice 
getting getting a visit from one president once itself is tough, but he, he, he visited twice. And Narendra Modi was welcomed, like open, um, very well received in the US when he visits every time. Uh, so the partnership between the US and uh, I mean, US and India is very, very uh, uh, strong right now. Therefore, India won't be uh, truly interested in, in revamping the NAM. Uh, therefore, maybe the leadership should come from elsewhere. Maybe I think Sri Lanka is a good, good place to start with because Sri Lanka is a small country. Nobody is threatened by Sri Lanka's foreign policy objectives internationally. And, and uh, Sri Lankan leaders could also benefit from that kind of activity. You know, they, it will boost their image internationally and things like that. Uh, so to answer the question, I don't, uh, given the nature of relationship between um, India and, I mean, Narendra Modi's government and the US right now, um, I don't see much of a mm -hmm. chance. Okay. okay. And I guess we'll take this final question. Chanuka has sent it in. Um, would neutrality be successful and practical for a country like Sri Lanka to face uh, Western countries within the current political and economic trends in force? I guess this is also... Can, 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 you, can, you, can, you, can you repeat, please? Uh, would neutrality be successful and practical for a country like Sri Lanka to face uh, Western countries within the current political and economic trends in force? I guess Chanuka is also asking this, Professor, because when you take the United States, the European Union, largest trading partners of Sri Lanka. Um, now, yes, Sri Lanka needs all countries out there because there's also an argument that comes up sometimes where Sri Lanka could have taken a very different path in the past. I guess uh, that argument has come up several times where what if Sri Lanka did not join NAM? What if Sri Lanka became pro-Western or continued a pro-Western stand? There are so many uh, hypothetical situations that are being discussed. Um, but in the current context of where we are seeing global trade, um, things the way they are unfolding, um, would it be successful? I think so. I think so. I think Sri Lanka maintaining this um, equal distance from major powers or equal closeness to major powers will bring Sri Lanka more benefits. That's, that's my take and foreign policy wongs could analyze that and come to a conclusion. I think Sri Lanka would benefit more if it tried to be in the middle rather than being a China ally. And because after some time, China is going to have a stronger say on Sri Lanka uh, because it doesn't have friends in the West and that will move Sri Lanka more into one, one, one camp. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see uh, lots of um, setbacks, possible setbacks. If Sri, if Sri Lanka's current foreign policy continues. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, the time that you have given us, for sharing your views, for responding to um, uh, the various queries that were made, the various views that were raised as well. Um, it's, it's something that gives us food for thought. We've got to look back. This is where history is so important. Historical uh, developments have been so important in understanding where we are today and where we want to take the country into the future. Uh, we've got to have a clear path, a clear idea. We've got to strategize. We've got to know what we want uh, before we actually set out to get something. So these are all options that are available, things that Sri Lanka should be looking at, things that uh, Sri Lanka should be considering very seriously from a foreign policy perspective, uh, not, for example, short-term appointments of ambassadors or um, uh, controversial issues arising or various other developments that take place outside of the country. Uh, it obviously reflects very badly um, on the island at that state and uh, foreign policy in general. So thank you. Thank you so much once again, uh, Professor, for taking time to join us. Uh, as you very rightly said, we first met at Bandung, uh, which was at the 60th anniversary uh, academic conference of Bandung, which was an amazing opportunity to get to know you at that time. Uh, and then we've had interactions thereafter as well. And thank you to everyone who has taken time to join us today to be a part of this discussion where the Avalog initiative focused on non-alignment in this particular month in this uh, second um, session that we have on the non-aligned movement uh, in the month of September. We have something new happening in the month of October. The Avalog lecture forum is going to expand. 
Uh, there will be uh, more information about that coming out very soon. Uh, by the 1st of October, that will be coming out. We've got special sessions arranged for the month of October in terms of interactive sessions, which are um, going to hopefully widen our outreach in terms of uh, people who are interested in international relations in Sri Lanka and beyond. So thank you once again, and uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, for taking your time and being with us today. And with that, we will bring this session to a close. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. All the very best to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.